Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is brought to you by the StarQuest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to episode 242 of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, where we look at mysteries from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. In this episode, we're talking about Rainmaker Charles Hatfield. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today is Jimmy Aiken. Hey, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. In 1915, the city of San Diego, California, was experiencing a drought. Local citizens demanded that the city council take action. So they hired a man named Charles Hatfield, who promised that he could make it rain. But they got much much more than they bargained for. And what happened is still remembered today. So who was Charles Hatfield? How did he try to make rain? And what happened in San Diego? Well, that's what we'll be talking about on this episode of Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World. So Jimmy, why did you want to cover this mystery now? Well, if you follow me on Facebook once or so a year, you'll see me post something like, help, help. Water is falling out of the sky. Why is this happening? What does it mean? Which is my way of poking fun at the fact that it rains very little here in San Diego, unlike Texas and Arkansas, where I'm from, where it rains quite a bit. Um, you'll be especially like me, likely to see me post something like this in December or January. Uh, January is the month in which San Diego experiences the most rainfall it gets all year. According to uh, rssweather.com, San Diego typically receives a grand total of 2.28 inches of rain in January, which is enough to allow the hillsides in San Diego County to briefly turn green for a few weeks before they go back to their usual brown. Now, 2.28 inches, that doesn't sound like a lot of rainfall. Well, it's not. Uh, In your own hometown of Boston, Massachusetts, the wettest month is November, and y'all get an average of 3.98 inches in November, which is almost twice as much as San Diego gets in its wettest month. Uh, Furthermore, in Boston, you get an average of three of more than three inches of rain every single month, whereas in San Diego, we get less than an inch for seven months of the year. In July, we get 0.03 inches. Um, My hometown of Fayetteville, Arkansas, gets between two and five inches every month, uh, with the wettest month being May, where we get 4.9 inches, and that's more than twice what San Diego gets. Uh, So San Diego is quite dry compared to other places, and that's part of why they call it sunny Southern California, because it doesn't rain much. It's almost always sunny. And yet, California is one of the major food producers, uh, producing sections of the United States. So how do they do that with so little rainfall? It isn't easy, and we do grow tons of the nation's food here. Uh, For example, one of the most productive areas is the San Joaquin Valley, which is twice the size of Massachusetts. But it requires a lot of water management to make that happen, including bringing in water from various rivers and river systems. And between the needs of agriculture and the needs of big cities like San Diego, Los Angeles, and San Francisco, water is a contentious political issue in California. Uh, Los Angeles, in particular, has been involved in a series of political conflicts known as the California Water Wars, which were featured in the famous 1974 movie Chinatown. I've run into examples of the ongoing conflict over water myself. A few years ago, I drove up to San Francisco and visited Ignatius Press, and this summer I drove up again for the International Remote Viewing Association Conference. And both times, as I'm driving through the farmlands, I would see hand-painted signs that the farmers had put out along the highway berating the governor for his water policies, which they felt were unjustly harming farmers for the benefit of city slickers. So water is still a very contentious issue in California. Uh, More than a century after today's mystery is set, it still hasn't been sorted out to everyone's satisfaction. So today's mystery is focused on a rainmaker named Charles Hatfield. 
but he's far from the first such person. How long have people been trying to make rain? Since at least the Neolithic or New Stone Age era, when agriculture began about 10,000 years ago, since agriculture needs water to happen. If a drought came and water was scarce, people would invoke God or the gods and ask for rain. Numerous cultures have specific rituals for making rain. Here in America, we're familiar with the rain dances that various Native American groups have, but there are rain-making rituals all over the world. Just for fun, I thought I'd share with the listeners a passage from uh, Robert Graves' book, Claudius the God and His Wife Messalina, that describes such rituals. Uh, Claudius the God is the sequel to Graves' other novel, I, Claudius, and it covers the period in Claudius's life after he became Roman emperor. Graves uh, was a classicist, and even though his books are fiction, they are closely based on actual historical sources, and I found it fascinating when I first read the books and encountered the following passage. I do need to warn super sensitive people that the passage is just ever so slightly off color, but it's not bad. The passage describes an event in AD 42 when Claudius sent the Roman general Gnaeus Hosidius Gaeta uh, into North Africa to subdue some rebels. Gaeta's water was running out and he was getting desperate. So Graves, speaking for Claudius, writes, now at Rome, when there is a drought, we know how to persuade the gods to send rain. There's a black stone called the Dripping Stone, captured originally from the Etruscans and stored in a temple of Mars outside the city. We go in solemn procession and fetch it within the walls, where we pour water on it, singing incantations and sacrificing. Rain always follows, unless there's been some slight mistake in the ritual, as is frequently the case. But Gaeta had no dripping stone with him, so he was completely at a loss. The nomads were accustomed to going without water for days at a time and knew the country perfectly besides. Gaeta had a black orderly who had been born in this very desert but had been sold as a slave to the Moors. He could not remember where the nearest water was because he had been sold when only a child. But he said to Gaeta, General, why don't you pray to Father Guagua? Gaeta inquired who this person might be. The man replied that he was the god of the deserts who gave rain in time of drought. Gaeta said, The emperor told me to suit my tactics to the country. Tell me how to invoke, Father Guagua, and I shall do so at once. The orderly told him to take a little pot, bury it up to the neck in the sand, and fill it with beer, saying as he did so, Father Guagua, we offer you beer. Then the men were to fill their drinking vessels with all the water that they had with them in their water skins, except enough to dip their fingers in and sprinkle on the ground. Then everyone must drink and dance and adore Father Guagua, sprinkling the water and drinking every drop in the skins. Geta himself must chant, As this water is sprinkled, so let rain fall. We have drunk our last drop, Father. None remains. What would you have us do? Drink beer, Father Guagua, and make water for us, your children, or we die. For beer is a powerful diuretic, and these nomads had the same theological notions as the early Greeks who considered that Jove made water, that is, urinated, when it rained, so that the same word, with a mere difference in gender, is still used in Greek for heaven and for chamber pot. The nomads considered that their god would be encouraged to make water, in the form of rain, by offering him a drink of beer. The sprinkling of water, like our own lustrations, was to remind him how rain fell, in case he had forgotten. Gaeta, in desperation, called his tottering force together and inquired whether anyone happened to have a little beer with him. And, by good luck, a party of German auxiliaries had a pint or two hoarded in a water skin. They had brought it with them in preference to water. Gaeta made them give it up to him. He then equally distributed all the water that was left, but the beer he reserved for Father Guagua. The troops danced and drank the water and sprinkled the necessary drops on the sand while Gaeta uttered the prescribed formula of invocation. Father Guagua, his name apparently means water, 
was so pleased and impressed by the honor paid him by this imposing force of perfect strangers that the sky was immediately darkened with rain clouds and a downpour began which lasted for three days and turned every sandy hollow into a brimming pool of water. The army was saved. The nomads, taking the abundant rain as an undeniable token of Father Guagua's favor toward the Romans, came humbly forward with offers of alliance. I think this story is really funny, and it's based on actual historical sources. The Romans really did have a dripping stone uh, that they used in, rain, in a rainmaking ceremony called the Aquilicium, which means calling the waters. And I like how Graves has Claudius say that when they used the dripping stone, rain always followed, unless some slight mistake was made in the ritual, which happened rather often really wasn't that reliable. Also, um, although I haven't been able to verify that Father Guagua was an actual North African deity, or the uh, exact details of the ritual were accurate, the fundamentals of the story are true. The Roman historian Cassius Dio reports that Gaeta really did run out of water, and really did use local rituals to make it rain. And it rained so much that the locals, who were Berbers, uh, thought that heaven was on the side of the Romans, and they sued for peace. What about the bit about the Greek language in the story? That's also true. Um, when I first read this, it struck me that the Greek word for heaven, uranos, is very close to the English word urin. In Greek, uranos is a masculine word, and if you flip it into the feminine, it becomes urane, which does mean chamber pot, so Graves was right about that. Also, the verb ureo means urinate, and I, I've read that when there was a heavy downpour, the Greeks sometimes would say Zeus ure, or Zeus is urinating. In any event, I find that story funny, and if you think about it, the god of heaven, Uranos, that's where we get the name of the planet Uranus. And people have pointed out whether you say Uranus or Uranus, it, it doesn't sound particularly great. And actually, there is an etymological connection there to bathroom stuff. So there you are. Mm, that is awesome because every dad with preteen boys whose long suffering mother, <laughs> not that I know anyone like that, <laughs> yeah. will get to tell that story. <laughs> That's awesome. So, anyway, if ancient peoples had religious rituals that they would do to make it rain, how did modern rainmakers get started? After the scientific revolution began in the 16th and 17th century, scientists or natural philosophers, as they were then called, began systematically studying many aspects of nature. And that included the weather, uh, giving us the emerging science of meteorology. Uh, it started to pick up steam in the 18th century, and by the 19th century, it was making real progress. In the 1800s, some natural philosophers were not only predicting when rain would happen, they also thought they were beginning to understand why it happened. And if you understand why rain happens, that opens the door to being able to make it happen. And so uh, the 1800s saw the birth of scientific attempts at rainmaking. Uh, one of the key figures was a man named James Pollard Espy. He was born in 1785, and although he was trained in the classics, he became interested in weather and became the foremost American meteorologist. In 1883, he published a theory that explained rainstorms in terms of the upward movement of air, or convection. In 1834, he convinced the Pennsylvania legislature to set up an observation system in each county of the state where the observers would each have a barometer, thermometer, and rain gauge to take measurements with. He also later proposed transmitting the weather data by that newfangled invention, the telegraph, allowing the development of scientific weather forecasting. In 1836, he began giving public lectures on his weather theories, which led to him being nicknamed the Storm King which is also a great name for a future member of the Legion of Superheroes, the Storm King. Um, in any event, in 1841, he published a famous book called The Philosophy of Storms, by which he meant the science of storms. 
and in 1843, he was appointed as the first meteorologist for the U.S. government. And so what did he think of rainmaking? He was in favor of it. Uh, SB was correct that one of the factors that makes it rain is warm air rising from the surface of the earth by convection. And so if you could make more hot air rise from the surface, you could potentially make it rain. In fact, as early as the 400s BC, the Greek historian Thucydides had noticed that rain often occurs after major fires, which of course generate hot air. And so in the philosophy of storms, Espy proposed burning forests in Appalachia to make it rain, which may be the earliest proposal for climate engineering. It's not clear to what extent Espy was ever able to do practical tests of his theory, but remember that idea of rainmaking by convection, because it'll come back later. If Espy's heat-based convection view of how to make rain was one view at the time, were there others that developed in the 19th century? Yeah, another was known as the concussion view. Uh, the idea was that if you caused concussions in the atmosphere, it will shake up the moisture in the sky and cause it to rain. And this was based on an observation of a connection between warfare and rainfall. In the first century AD, the Greek philosopher Plutarch wrote, Extraordinary rains pretty generally fall after great battles. Whether it be that some divine power thus washes and cleanses the polluted earth, with showers from above, or that moist and heavy evaporations steaming forth from the blood and corruption thicken the air, which naturally is subject to alteration from the smallest causes. So the ancients had noted a connection between battles and rainfall, and in later centuries, gunpowder was invented, and the connection continued to be noted. Um, in a, it received a particular boost after the late unpleasantness or American Civil War. Uh, in his book, The Rainmaker, author Clark Spence writes, The Civil War did much to popularize the idea. Hundreds of thousands of soldiers, Yankee and rebel alike, were convinced by firsthand experience in mud and slush that gunfire inevitably brought down torrents of rain. Supporters of the concussion theory strongly urged that careful investigation be made on the assumption that artificial battles could be devised to revolutionize agriculture in dry areas. Whether or not the unusually cool and wet weather of the South in 1863 had any connection with heavy artillery concussions or with the chemical effects of burning such an immense amount of villainous saltpeter was not clear, but was a matter for serious inquiry. The theory received another boost after the war when, in 1871, a civil engineer from Chicago named Edward Powers published a book called War and the Weather, or The Artificial Production of Rain. In War and the Weather, he cited 200 battles that were associated with rainfall. With all the cannons and other weapons going off in battle, it was thought that the air quakes these produced, or maybe the gases that or heat that they released caused the rain. And Powers proposed using explosives in rainmaking equipment. After the book was published, the concussion theory of rainfall received new attention. Spence writes, Edward Powers was encouraged in his efforts by Daniel Ruggles of Virginia, whom some have called the real inventor of the rain-producing process. A veteran of the Mexican campaigns, former Brigadier General in the Confederate Army, and owner of a ranch along the Rio Bravo in Texas, Ruggles, in 1880, had patented a new and useful mode of producing rain or precipitating rainfalls from rain clouds. Ruggles' idea, which some charged he had appropriated from the real inventor, a German farmer in New Zealand, concerned the use of small, cheap balloons capable of carrying aloft explosives to be detonated by a time fuse or by electricity from the ground. The aerial concussion thus created, contended Ruggles, would condense vapor in the air, thereby precipitating rain to sustain vegetation, prevent drought, and also to purify and renovate the atmosphere during periods of pestilence and epidemics. One of the people who was influenced by Powers' theories was a United States Department of Agriculture agent named Robert St. George 
Dyronforth. And Dyronforth got funding from the U.S. government to test the concussion theory. At this time, there was a very severe drought happening in South Texas, and it was so bad that it was called the Great Die because lots of things were dying. In an article for True West magazine, author Johnny Boggs writes, The drought of 1890-94 to would be called the Great Die in South Texas. The cattle wandering over the prairie perishing, how their lowing wrung my heart, wrote Robert Kleberg manager of the sprawling King Ranch, southwest of Corpus Christi. The Great Die killed not only livestock, but also ranches, farms, banks, and even towns. So in 1891, Dyronforth took a team with him and went to Texas to test the concussion theory. According to Boggs, At Sea Ranch, Dyronforth's team constructed 60 mortar-like guns and placed explosives in prairie dog and badger holes. They flew kites with dynamite sticks suspended from them by electrical fuses and tied the kite strings to brush. They launched hydrogen-filled balloons, and on August 9th, they set off the explosions. The next morning, glory be, it rained. For two hours, it poured, causing water to run into the draws and the plains to be drenched, Dyronforth reported. It rained so suddenly, so unexpectedly, that the team had not bothered setting out any rain gauges, so Dyronforth could only estimate that an inch had fallen. Unfortunately, it also rained in other nearby locations where explosions had not been set off, so the results were inconclusive. Dyronforth and his team then conducted additional experiments in other locations in Texas. Some had better results than others, but overall the results were encouraging. Still, not everyone was convinced, so the next year, in 1892, Dyronforth returned to San Antonio and did more experiments. Unfortunately, the 1892 experiments were judged a failure, and the U.S. government pulled his funding. Dyronforth inherited a particularly nasty nickname as a result. His detractors began re referring to Dyronforth as Dry Henceforth. Mm. So, we have two theories about how to make it rain. The heat-based convection theory and the explosive-based concussion theory. Were there others? Another theory that gained popularity in the 1890s was the chemical theory. Uh, the idea was that you could mix up batches of certain chemicals, release them into the atmosphere, and these would cause it to rain. Of course, the chemicals tended to smell bad, and so practitioners of the chemical theory were known as smell makers. One of the major figures using this method was a gentleman named Frank Melbourne, who was also known as the Rain Wizard. He was born in Ireland, though he'd spent a lot of time in Australia and New Zealand, and so he was also called an Australian Rain Doctor. As a smell maker, Melbourne uh, would set up batches of chemicals and then funnel the vapors up into the atmosphere to cause rain. So that's our third method of rainmaking, the chemical method or smell making. How successful was rainmaking at this time? What did people think about it? It varied depending on who you were talking to. Even though there were meteorologists like James Pollard Espy that believed in rainmaking, there were a lot who didn't. And those at the U.S. Weather Bureau tended to be on the skeptical side. The Weather Bureau would diss rainmakers when people asked about them. They would even seek to publish articles in the press running down rainmakers by name and trying to ruin their reputation. And they had arguments against the rainmakers, which we'll cover, so they could be quite hostile to the enterprise. On the other hand, a lot of people did believe in rainmaking and were willing to pay substantial sums of money for it. If you were a farmer or rancher, your crops and animals needed rain to survive, and you could get really desperate, even facing financial ruin, if the rains didn't come on time. In fact, due to the expansion of the American frontier after the Civil War, people were now farming and ranching in parts of America that didn't get a lot of rain to begin with, including Southern California. So rainmakers would get a much more favorable reception in farm country, especially during times of drought. But not if the rainmakers never produce results. If you're a cash-strapped, desperate farmer or rancher facing financial ruin, 
You're not going to pay hard-earned money to a rainmaker who never produces results. Yeah, to be successful, the rainmakers had to achieve a certain level of success. They didn't have to be successful in each and every instance, and they weren't, but they were successful enough to stay in business and keep interest up in rainmaking as a discipline. For example, um, you know, rainmaking equipment was exhibited in 1893 at the Chicago World's Fair, and there were even rainmaking companies that were formed. The most famous of these was the Interstate Artificial Rain Company, which was founded in 1892. Others included the Swisher Rain Company of Topeka, Kansas, the Goodland Artificial Rain Company, and the Genuine Northwest Kansas Rain Company. So these weren't just lone rainmakers in business for themselves. These were companies with multiple employees and teams that would go around to make rain. And like the solo operators, the companies also had mixed success. Sometimes they would make it rain and the customers would be happy. Sometimes they'd fail to make it rain and the customers would be mad. And sometimes they'd make too much rain and the customers also would be mad. Clark Spence writes, More than once, the rainmakers left behind them angry citizens. One of the Goodland Company operators tried his hand in Minden, Nebraska, and after five days of smelly but arid effort, decided to leave. But the citizens first tied him to a telegraph pole, turned the hose of the fire company on him, and showed how it could make rain. At Council Grove, Stewart collected only part of his fee on behalf of the same firm. His storm left behind broken awnings and windows, and a host of disgruntled citizens. A.B. Montgomery was another who got more than he had bargained for. In the name of the Interstate Company, he took credit for rain around Emporia in the summer of 1892. A cloudburst of the same storm system destroyed James Butler's wheat crop and washed out track of the Santa Fe Railroad, causing the death of an engineer. Butler threatened to sue for damages, and the engineer's wife did enter a suit for $10,000, or $327,000 $327,000 today after the inflation the government has caused. Apparently, neither case was completed, but they posed some interesting questions. If rainmaking were possible, what was the extent of the responsibility of the operator? Could the courts distinguish between natural and man made rain? How? And some believe that even a substantial judgment for rain caused damages would be a cheap way of establishing a rainmaking reputation worth millions. And it's certainly true that if a court found you liable for damages caused by rain you'd made, you could advertise on that and exhibit it as legal proof that you were a powerful rainmaker. But the boom era for the companies passed pretty quickly, and by 1894, the boom period was over. Most individual rainmakers also tended not to have careers that lasted very long. They'd go into business for a while, but then get out of it, with the exception of one man. That brings us to the main figure in today's mystery, Charles Mallory Hatfield. Who was he and why is he famous? Charles Hatfield was born in Fort Scott, Kansas in 1875, but his family moved to Southern California when he was a child in the 1880s. This was symbolic in a way. Kansas had been the center of rainmaking activities in the 1890s with the various companies we mentioned, but after their heyday, the rainmaking action started to shift to Southern California at the turn of the century, and Charles Hatfield, as a child, made his own shift from Kansas to SoCal. Uh, Hatfield's family first moved to San Diego, but later they went to Los Angeles, and as a young man, Hatfield became a sewing machine salesman for the New Home Sewing Machine Company in Los Angeles. But he also became interested in rainmaking in the late 1890s when he was in his early 20s, and he went on to be described as probably the most successful rainmaker of modern times. He also was the longest lasting one with a career that effectively spanned 30 years. One of the reasons may have been that he didn't come off as the kind of fast-talking con man that some rainmakers did. Charles seemed to be very sincere to people. In an article for JSTOR Daily, Christopher Klein writes, Although a salesman by trade, 
Hatfield was no smooth-talking huckster. Born into a devout Quaker family, he had a polite, homespun manner. His piercing eyes were as blue as water, and his eerily pale skin suggested that he had little affinity for the sun. And as we'll see, people today, a century later, have also judged Charles to be sincere. We've covered three kinds of rainmaking that were used in the 19th century. The convection, concussion, and chemical methods. How did Hatfield make rain? He used the chemical method, so he was a smell maker. Clark Spence writes, Sometime in the late 90s, according to his own account, he first tried his method from an old windmill tower on his father's ranch on Bonsall, near San Diego, but never patented it for fear that rain producers would spring up like mushrooms all over the country. His first experiments had been made in his kitchen, he said, when he noticed that certain chemical combinations caused steam from the tea kettle to move to them. Hatfield described his secret method as mainly chemical affinity with the atmosphere. I have nothing to do with bombs, dynamite, or explosives of any kind whatever. My methods are original. He concocted his chemicals, 23 of them it was said, in casks, allowing them to age a few days before they were placed in galvanized evaporating pans atop wooden towers 20 or more feet high. In the daytime, solar heat speeded vaporization, and at night, combustion, fire for heat, was added. Only a mild odor was given off, according to Hatfield, although one editor thought otherwise. Nearby farmers might be convinced a Limburger cheese factory has broken loose. These gases smell so bad that it rains in self-defense, the editor said. Electricity was somehow also an agent in the Hatfield process, with special equipment to provide the required power. Hatfield also had an interesting explanation for his process. I do not make rain, he said. That would be an absurd claim. I merely attract the clouds and they do the rest. It is a mere matter of cohesive attraction and the conditions that produce rain are drawn by my system just as a magnet draws steel. My system consists of chemical combinations working in harmony with the very law that makes rain in a natural sense, he explained. Hatfield did his early experiments near San Diego in 1902 and 1903, but then he moved up to the Los Angeles area. He also used his little brother Paul, who was 17 years old at the time, as an assistant, and Paul would help him throughout his career. He had already experimented with towers in Big Tahunga Canyon and at Inglewood, where the Hatfield family now resided, and claimed success in each instance. Early in December 1904, he was operating in Rubio Canyon near Altadena, apparently financed by a number of Los Angeles merchants, especially sewing machine dealers. Almost immediately, cloud coaxer Hatfield found himself in controversy with George E. Franklin, the official weather forecaster in Los Angeles, who predicted a general rain farther north, but doubted it would reach the City of the Angels. At first, according to gleeful newsmen, Hatfield's chemical affinity highball made no impact. Then, while Franklin tacked up more fair weather bulletins, the rainmaker mixed it another hydrochloric fizz. The new wizard of the clouds went at it night and day for a week, with only snatches of sleep and food gulped down at work. Showers did fall in Altadena, about one-third inch, which weather guesser Franklin thought either natural or a special dispensation of providence, but certainly not artificial. Hatfield is drunk on rainwater, crowed the Los Angeles Daily Herald. When he becomes sober, he will bring his chemicals to the city and ask for Mr. Franklin's place. Except to the Weather Bureau, such publicity was encouraging, and the Daily Times reported that Hatfield's water factory, according to its operator, had proved successful 19 out of 20 times, and even the one exception was questionable since rain had fallen in the mountains nearby. So Hatfield had made a promising public debut, and as a cloud coaxer who had defeated the mere weather guesser, weather weather man, he now made the people of Los Angeles an offer. He said he would produce 18 inches of rain between mid-December 1904 and late April 1905, which is more rain than the area would normally get. In exchange, for $1,000, or $33,000 after all the inflation the government has caused. George Franklin, the weather guesser, 
scoffed. And some Angelinos jokingly begged Hatfield not to let it rain on Los Angeles' annual Rose Bowl parade on New Year's Day. But in January, the rain started up. In mid-March, a reporter came out to interview Hatfield, the cloud coaxer, where he was working in his tent by his rainmaking equipment. And by that point, so this is mid-March, he'd already been able to produce 17 and two-thirds inches of rain for the area, just a third of an inch less than the 18 inches he'd promised, and he still had six weeks to get that extra third of an inch. He did make it to 18 inches, at which point he offered to throw in an extra two inches for free. Afterwards, he was paid his $1,000, and he made headlines all over the country and even further with newspapers in London reporting on his results. People even started referring to reigning as hatfielding, so he was getting serious new respect. But some wondered if he could actually control the rain he was making. Yeah, maybe he would turn out to be a, quote, Frankenstein of the air, who would create a, a, quote, storm monster that he cannot control. Fortunately, if an irate mob of villagers ever decided to do to him what had been done to Dr. Frankenstein, Hatfield and his brother Paul were well prepared. He was very protective of his rainmaking process. In fact, he was quite secretive about it, which is why he never patented it, so he could keep the method secret. He had an impressive array of shotguns, pistols, and knives he used to keep the two curious at bay, and he would actually chase people away with the weapons if they got too nosy. So he was well equipped to deal with a potential mob of angry villagers. What happened with Hatfield after his success in Los Angeles in 1905? He went on to have a successful career as a rainmaker for decades. Uh, He worked not only in California, but in other locations as well. He got inquiries asking him to solve drought problems in Cuba, Australia, Tunisia, Colombia, Panama, and South Africa. But he didn't like to travel very much, so he didn't go to those places. He did go to the Yukon Territory to produce rain to help a company engaged in hydraulic mining that needed water for their mining processes. And he did go to Honduras to put out jungle fires and save 700,000 acres of bananas that were being farmed by the Standard Steamship and Fruit Company of New Orleans. And he brought five inches of rain to Medicine Hat in Alberta, Canada, for which he was paid $8,000 or $133,000 today. And in 1922, there was a really interesting story about him. Spence writes, In the summer of 1922, Hatfield was reported in Naples, invited by the Italian government to break a five-month-old drought. He was anxious, according to the press, to explain his work to Pope Pius, and if the pontiff agreed, to invoke a little secular reign on the Vatican Gardens. Tradition has it that when he set up shop near Naples, all southern Italy was flooded, farmers went wild with joy, and Dr. Hatfield, as the local newspapers called him, became a bigger hero than Mussolini. But this was a case of myth quickly outgrowing reality. As Brother Paul later explained, we were never in Italy. So the story about him going to Italy was apparently just a myth that the newspapers printed, not something that actually happened. But It would have been a cool story if it had. Now, we've been focusing on some of Hatfield's successes. Was he always successful? No, he he wasn't. He did have a lot of success, including enough to get repeat business from satisfied customers. But nobody working with a process as chaotic as the weather is going to be able to be successful all the time. Spence writes, Although the rainmaker continued his work, it was not always with success. In 1924, while he was under contract with San Bernardino County farmers, natural rain upset his schedule. Again, in King County, he was hauling wood for his tower when the rain commenced. In North Dakota, a year later, he failed to meet his contract terms. But unless Weather Bureau spokesmen pointed them out, the public heard little of the failures. They warranted no headlines and only slight coverage, and did little to tarnish the image of Hatfield as a true bringer of rainfall. 
Once in March of 1924, Hatfield got more than he bargained for. And to understand this one, you need to know that people sometimes referred to Jupiter Pluvius or Jove Pluvius, since Jupiter or Jove is the Roman equivalent of Zeus and Pluvia is Latin for rain. So Jupiter Pluvius means Jupiter the rainmaker. Spence writes, In mid-March 1924, for example, Hatfield built a tower in the hills west of Coalinga, California, on the western fringe of the San Joaquin Valley. Coalinga had contributed $1,500, Lemoore $3,250, and Corcoran $3,350. Hatfield was to receive $2,000 an inch for four inches, but nothing for less than one and a half inches. His press was good. He was shown rigging his Tower of Showers, preparing for this task of tickling the clouds to tears and persuading Jove Pluvius to turn on the celestial sprinkling cart. His timing was superb. Old Jupe was angry, and it rained little fishes. A cloudburst washed away Hatfield's tent and forced him to spend the night in a tree, an experience well worth the inconvenience in his case. Subsequently, he let the world know that he was responsible for the splendid rainfall and was pictured in the Los Angeles Herald, an umbrella under his arm, wearing his $8,000 smile. Which would be a $140,000 smile today. But he was at least inconvenienced by the rain he produced, washing away his tent and forcing him to spend the night in a tree. Also, since we just mentioned Jupiter Pluvius, I should mention that the next year, in 1925, a new word was coined for rainmaking. As I said, the Latin word for rain is pluvia, and the word for cultivation is cultura. So rainmaking, or rain cultivation, became known as pluviculture. And you'll hear Hatfield and his colleagues referred to as pluviculturists, which is a cool word. We've been looking at experiences Hatfield had at different points in his career, but we haven't touched on the mystery I described at the beginning of the episode, which was Hatfield's most famous experience. So tell us what happened. The beginning of the event is explained by Christopher Klein in his article for JSTOR Daily. He writes, A century ago, in 1915, as today, San Diego thirsted for water. Dangerously low reservoir levels threatened the region's potential to grow. Promoters of the city's Panama, California Exposition, entering its second year, worried about the drought's impact on fair attendance. A civic organization, the San Diego Wide Awake Improvement Club, demanded action. Onto the arid stage and into San Diego's city council chamber on December 13, 1915, stepped a potential savior, a dapper 40-year-old former sewing machine salesman named Charles Mallory Hatfield, vowed to make it rain. The self-professed moisture accelerator told the councilors that he could have the marina reservoir, only one-third full at the time, overflowing within a year for a fee of $10,000 to be paid only if he succeeded. By the time he made his offer to San Diego in 1915, Hatfield could point to 17 contracts he had signed with commercial entities ranging from cotton growers in Texas to mine operators in Alaska. He commanded as much as $4,000 in return for the delivery of the four-inch rainfall that he typically promised to municipalities across Southern California as a result of his chemical concoctions. San Diego's desperate city council was willing to give Hatfield the job, particularly because it would only have to pay out in the event that a deluge struck the city. Its heads, the city wins, Tails, Hatfield loses, said Councilman Walter Moore, after his fellow members verbally agreed to hire the rainmaker. Only Councilman Herbert Fay objected to the deal, calling it rank foolishness. With the city council's agreement, Charles then set off to work. He took his younger brother Joel, rather than Paul this time, and went to Moreno Reservoir, 60 miles east of San Diego. Klein continues, Hatfield set off deep into the woods, 60 miles east of the city, and began construction of a 20-foot tower near the banks of the Moreno Reservoir. He poured his rainmaking brew into shallow iron pans resting on a platform at the top of the wooden structure. Curiosity seekers reported that Hatfield set the fluids on fire 
and let the smoke drift skyward. One witness noted that the noxious chemicals smelled as if a Limburger cheese factory has broken loose. When a light sprinkle christened the new year, a newspaper headline cheered, Rainmaker Hatfield induces clouds to open. The rain grew steadier over the next couple of weeks. But now those early worries about whether Hatfield could control the rain he made came home to roost. He was about to become the Frankenstein of the air that some feared, and he unleashed a storm monster that he could not control. Remember that in January, San Diego normally receives only two and a quarter inches of rain. Well, on January 15th, a biblical rain started to descend from the heavens. As much as 17 inches of rain fell on the mountains outside San Diego over the ensuing five days as rejoicing quickly morphed into horror. The San Diego River leapt over its banks and ran a mile wide. Landslides oozed down saturated mountains. Floodwaters washed away nearly everything in the vicinity, including homes, roads, railroad tracks, telephone lines, and the entire community of Little Landers. Although rain was simultaneously dousing cities up and down the Pacific coastline, even skeptical San Diegans wondered if Hatfield indeed possessed Pluvian powers. Let's pay Hatfield $10,000 to quit, quipped one property owner after he was rescued in a rowboat. The San Diego Union reported that Hatfield called City Hall to say, within the next few days, I expect to make it really rain. When asked if he was joking, he replied, never more serious in my life. Just hold your horses and I'll show you a real rain. Indeed, the drenching rains quickly returned after a brief respite with deadly consequences. On January 27th, the mighty stone dam at the lower Otay Reservoir gave way, sending a 40-foot wall of water thundering to the coastline. And you may recall Lower Otay Reservoir from episode 164 on Luis Santiago, the Border Patrol ghost. Lower Otay Reservoir was the site outside San Diego where Agent Santiago was chasing illegals when he fell to his death. More than a dozen people died in the torrent that swept away all trees, livestock, and houses in its path. By the time the epic rain stopped in San Diego County, nearly 30 inches had fallen in a month making January 1916 the wettest period in the region's recorded history. Indeed, with the area normally receiving only two and a quarter inches of rain in January, receiving 30 inches was more than 13 times what it normally received. The county coroner estimated that 50 people had died in what residents began to call Hatfield's Flood. With communication and transportation lines severed, naval ships were required to ferry people and supplies in and out of San Diego. As promised by Hatfield, water lapped to the top of Morena Reservoir, yet no one was particularly happy about it. The flood also damaged our sister city, Tijuana, over the border in Mexico. After Hatfield's flood, Spence explains, A front-page cartoon in the San Diego Union showed an irate farmer chasing the rainmaker into the city's bay. It was rumored that armed vigilantes went seeking the Hatfield brothers and that Charles fled on horseback across the desert toward Duma, Arizona, and we never heard of him again for many, many years. This was in error. Because, remember, Hatfield was well prepared for any potential mob of angry villagers with all those shotguns, pistols, and knives. The two well-armed Hatfields walked the 60 miles back to San Diego, and on the afternoon of February 4th, Charles held a press conference in Fred Binney's office on 7th Street. The sky milker came with the demeanor of the proverbial conquering hero, home from the fray and awaiting the laurel wreath, said the Union. He announced that he had lived up to his promise to fill Morena Reservoir and would now formally lay his claim for $10,000 before the city council. A few days later, the council considered it quietly, because some members were pretty sensitive about it, and referred it to city attorney Terence Cosgrove, a tough, shrewd lawyer on the make. So, with Charles having fulfilled his side of the bargain, he now rightly wanted to be paid, but the city council was waffling on the deal and had referred the matter to their lawyer. 
What did City Attorney Cosgrove do? Cosgrove was very hesitant to pay Charles what he was owed because people were starting to sue the city for compensation as a result of the damage caused by Hatfield's flood. If the city paid Charles, that could be taken by the courts as an admission that Charles had produced the rain for the city. And since the city had hired him to do so, that would make the city liable for the damages in the courts, which at this point potentially amounted to $3.5 million, or $96 million today. So Cosgrove recommended not paying him for two reasons. The first was that, despite the fact that the city had authorized a written contract to be drawn up, it never actually got drawn up, or at least never got signed. So Charles had undertaken his efforts on the basis of a verbal contract. And while they say that a verbal contract isn't worth the paper it's printed on, that's not actually true. In courts of law, verbal contracts are enforceable, but Cosgrove could use the lack of a written contract to obscure the matter. What was the second reason Cosgrove cited for not paying Charles? He argued that until proven otherwise, the flood should be considered an act of God rather than something that Charles had produced. Furthermore, Spence reports that he argued, Hatfield had claimed he was directly responsible for 4 billion gallons of water in the reservoir and indirectly responsible for another 10 billion whereupon Cosgrove insisted that Morena could not be filled with Hatfield's mere 4 billion gallons. Hence, he had not lived up to his offer. Acting on its attorney's recommendation, the council then rejected Hatfield's claim, although more than one member believed they had an unwritten obligation to the rainmaker. Threatening to bring suit, Hatfield next proposed a compromise on a pro rata basis, which would also be rejected. Arguing that his reputation was more important than the money, he announced he would settle for $4,000 instead of $10,000. But the city rejected that revised offer. Meanwhile, city lawyers promised to recommend payment of every cent of Hatfield's claim if he would sign a statement assuming responsibility for the flood and relieving the city of damages. With some $3.5 million in claims pending, even though most would never be collected, the rainmaker could ill afford to agree. So. Charles didn't agree, and he then filed suit against the city of San Diego for non-payment of the debt. What ended up happening with that lawsuit? It didn't end up going anywhere. Uh, Reportedly, Charles didn't pursue it very vigorously. Uh, Partly that could be because, as he said, his reputation was more important to him than the $4,000 that he had made an offer for. That way, he could say that he had filed suit to defend his name and portray himself as wronged by the city. Also, it may have been because he had other lucrative contracts that would bring him as much money or more. Uh, This was only a decade into his career, and he had more than a decade of rainmaking money ahead of him. There were two trials, uh, and both ruled that the rain had been an act of God, which meant Charles was off the hook for the damages, but also that he wouldn't get paid. Eventually, the case was dismissed in 1938 as a dead issue just to get it off the docket, and Charles was never paid anything by San Diego. When did Charles's career end? In the 1930s. Uh, by that point, the Great Depression had started, and one of the features of the Great Depression was the Dust Bowl, when dust storms ravaged parts of the American and Canadian prairies. The Dust Bowl was brought on partly by the farming methods of the time and partly by severe drought. So you'd think rainmakers like Charles would be in high demand. And there were, in fact, proposals to have Charles help out with the Dust Bowl. But the economic realities of the Great Depression meant that there wasn't any money to spend on rainmaking projects. So the Depression meant the, that Charles's career finally ended. It's also been speculated that another factor may have been the fact that California started bringing in water from the Colorado River, and that this also reduced the need for his services. In any event, he was no longer doing rainmaking gigs after, the 19, after about 1930, and he moved back to Glendale, California, in the Los Angeles area, where he took up selling sewing machines again. 
What happened to him in later years? Did he ever do anything in public again? He did come to the attention of the press in 1956. In that year, Paramount Pictures released a film starring Burt Lancaster and Katharine Hepburn called The Rainmaker. It was based on a 1954 play of the same name, and it was kind of, sort of, not really based on Charles's life. About the only thing that the characters have in common is that he's a guy who claims to make it rain. But beyond that, Burt Lancaster's character is totally different from Charles. He's a total fast-talking con man instead of having the quiet, sincere persona that Charles did. Nevertheless, the studio invited Charles to come to the premiere of the film, which he did, and that helped generate the press coverage that the studio was looking for. Charles then passed on to his reward two years later, in 1958, at the age of 82. All right, now before we get to our theories and faith and reason perspectives, we'd like to take a moment to thank our patrons who make the show possible, including James P., Reverend Sam V., Chase H., Nicholas M. and Roy V. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World and all the shows at StarQuest. And you can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part through the generous support of our sponsors, including Aaron Ferguson Electric and Automation at aaronv.com. A-A-R-O-N-V dot com. Making connections for life for your automation and smart home needs in North and Central Florida. And by Catechism Class, a dynamic weekly podcast journey through the Catechism of the Catholic Church. By Greg and Jennifer Willits. It's the best book club, coffee talk, and faith study group all rolled into one. Find it in any podcast directory. Jimmy, what theories are there about Charles Hatfield and his rainmaking colleagues? The key issue we need to look at is the extent to which, if any, he and others actually produced any rain. We'll also have a few matters to look at from the faith perspective. Let's then talk about the faith perspective first. What should we say here? Unlike some religions, uh, Christianity doesn't seem to have any distinctive rainmaking rituals. Uh, We don't, for example, have rain dances like some North American religions. However, uh, God is in control of whether it rains or not, and Christians do pray for rain, especially in farming communities in times of drought. In fact, if you look in the Roman Missal, there are special masses, uh, one for rain, one for fine weather, and one for an end to storms in case you're getting too much rain. We also see God's control of the weather in the Bible. In uh, James 5, verses 17 and 18, we read, Elijah was a man of like nature with ourselves. And he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth brought forth its fruit. There's also a famous story about a Jewish wonder worker from the first century BC named Honi the Circle Drawer. And the reason he's called the Circle Drawer is connected with an incident of rainmaking. According to the Talmud, The Mishnah relates an incident occurred in which the people said to Honi, the circle drawer, pray that rain should fall. He said to them, go out and bring in the clay ovens used to roast the paschal lambs so that they will not dissolve in the water as torrential rains are certain to fall. He prayed and no rain fell at all. What did he do? He drew a circle on the ground and stood inside it and said before God, Master of the universe, your children have turned their faces toward me as I am like a member of your household. Therefore, I take an oath by your great name that I will not move from here until you have mercy upon your children and answer their prayers for rain. Rain began to trickle down, but only in small droplets. He said, I do not ask for this, but for rain to fill the cisterns, ditches, and caves with enough water to last the entire year. Rain began to fall furiously. He said, I did not ask for this damaging rain either, but for rain of benevolence, blessing, and generosity. Subsequently, the rains fell in their standard manner, but continued unabated, filling the city with water until all of the Jews exited the residential areas of Jerusalem and went to the Temple Mount due to the rain. 
They came and said to him, Just as you prayed over the rains that they should fall, so too pray that they should stop. He said to them, Go out and see if the claimant's stone, a large stone located in the city, upon which proclamations would be posted with regard to lost and found articles, has been washed away. In other words, if the water has not obliterated the claimant's stone, it is not yet appropriate to pray for the rain to cease. Shimon ben Shetak, the prince of the Sanhedrin at the time, relayed to Honi the circle drawer, Were you not Honi, I would have decreed that you be ostracized, but what can I do to you? You nag God, and he does your bidding, like a son who nags his father, and his father does his bidding without reprimand. After all, rain fell as you requested. So, according to the Talmud, Coney drew a circle, stood in it, and then played the part of Goldilocks with God, petitioning him for rain that was not too soft and not too hard, but for rain that was just right. And because God complied with these requests, he didn't end up getting excommunicated. And I think that's a very interesting story. Let's talk about the moral issues that we alluded to in Charles's case and those of other rainmakers who sometimes produced too much rain. Assuming they really did this, what responsibility would they have for the results? Well, I think there is a serious moral issue here. People are responsible for the consequences of their actions. So if you make so much rain that it causes damage, like what happened in Hatfield's flood, then you're responsible for that. However, I think there are two qualifiers that need to be pointed out. The first is that the responsibility also falls on the person or people who hired you. Whoever knows about the risk being taken and assumes it is responsible if something goes wrong. So it wouldn't be just the rainmaker that would be morally responsible, but also his employers, which in Charles's case would be the City Council of San Diego. The moral responsibility would thus be a shared one. What's the second qualifier that needs to be pointed out? You have to judge the moral responsibility based on the knowledge that people have. If someone doesn't realize that their actions entail risk, then they're not fully culpable. I mean, they may be legally culpable, but that doesn't mean they're morally culpable. And this was the early days of rainmaking. While there was some evidence that rainmakers might be able to produce destructive amounts of rain, assuming that rainmaking worked at all, It was still an early experimental time, and we have to take that into account. I just don't think you can assign blame morally to people back then, either to the rainmakers or their employers, except in proportion to the knowledge they had at the time. And the knowledge in this period was quite limited, as rainmaking was not yet a well-understood, developed practice. What about a second moral issue? You mentioned how, in California today, water rights are a sensitive political issue. If you use all the water for the city slickers, then it's not available for use by the rural farmers. Doesn't rainmaking pose the same kind of risk? If you make rain in one area, that might keep it from falling in another area, depriving that region's people of water. It does. Um, Instead of fighting over land water rights, we'd essentially be looking at sky water rights. If you use rainmaking to bring down the rain in one area, then you're likely denying rain to another area. Helping one community thus could hurt another, resulting in a robbing Peter to pay Paul situation. So, morally speaking, careful attention also needs to be paid to how rainmaking affects other communities. There are ways of navigating this issue, but you can't just assume that your rainmaking efforts won't have collateral effects elsewhere. Those also need to be taken into account, and a fair and acceptable situation needs to be figured out. Now, what can we say about Charles Hatfield and the other rainmakers from the reason perspective? Were they producing any rain at all? You said that there were skeptics who criticized them. What arguments did the skeptics use? The main argument was that the rainmakers weren't really doing anything beyond what typical weather forecasters were doing. In other words, they were making educated guesses about when it would rain. Uh, Sometimes they'd be right by random chance, and there was no actual efficacy to their rainmaking abilities. In the 19th and early 20th centuries, they didn't have modern weather forecasting. 
And even today, weather forecasting isn't super accurate due to the chaos in the weather system, making it hard to predict. It was even worse when I was a kid in the 1970s, and people regularly made jokes about how wrong the TV weathermen were. And so back in the early 20th century and in the 19th century, weather guessing was a lot more guessing and a lot less scientific. But there were government meteorologists making predictions, however dubious they were, and there were long-term predictions printed in works like almanacs. It was discovered at one point uh, that 1890s rainmaker Frank Melbourne had picked target dates that were identical with the days predicted for rain in a long-term forecast in a popular almanac. Furthermore, there's some evidence, and not conclusive evidence, that he was using a barometer, which could have helped him figure out when rain was more likely. And skeptics looked at this as evidence of him being a fake. Do you think that these things would indicate he was a fake? Not necessarily. Uh, it seems to me that it could be read either way. It could mean that Melbourne was a conscious fraud who was timing his rainmaking to when rain was likely to occur. But it also could mean that Melbourne was sincere and that he was trying to use his rainmaking technique at the best possible times. I mean, after all, your technique is more likely to work whenever there's already a good chance of rain. You really want to deliver rain for your customers, which is what they're paying you for. You'd wait until there was a good chance of rain, and then you'd use your technique to yank it down out of the sky to ensure that it rains, whereas it only might have rained if you didn't use your technique. I mean, think about it. I, if I'm a totally serious, sincere rainmaker, my client's interests are what I care about. I don't care about proving things to mocking skeptics. I care about getting water for my client. So I'll be inclined to wait until there's water up in the sky in conditions where it has a good chance of coming down for my client, and then I'll use my technique to bring it down and give my client what he wants. Proving things to skeptics and getting water for your client are two different enterprises, and a serious rainmaker is going to be primarily interested in the latter. So we see how a totally serious rainmaker would use things like weather forecasts and barometers to help him bring down the rain. Those things wouldn't be a sign of fraud because they're equally consistent with being a sign of sincerity. But in order to get clients in the first place, rainmakers would need to offer something as proof of what they did. And they knew that skeptics would just point it out if they always did their rainmaking when rain was in the forecast. How do they handle that situation? Rainmakers did need to do a certain amount of proof-oriented demonstrations in order to convince people that what they were doing was real. And they had a couple ways of doing that. One way was to make rain when it was not in the forecast. That was a fairly common method, and they had some success with it. But their skeptics could always say it was random chance. In particular, they could say it was just regression to the mean. Now, that's a term that's come up before on the show. What is regression to the mean? It's a concept that was popularized in the 19th century by the British national natural philosopher Sir Francis Galton. Uh, he did early work in statistics, and one of the things he discovered is that extreme characteristics of parents tend not to be passed on completely to their offspring. So if the parents are really tall or really short, or if they're really intelligent or really unintelligent, the children tend not to be as extreme in these ways. The kids will be less tall or less short less intelligent or less unintelligent. In other words, the kids will be more average. They will be closer to the mathematical average or mean. This phenomenon of regression to the mean, to the average, is what keeps stable systems from veering off and becoming ever more and more extreme. That's why we don't have adult humans 
who are 75 feet tall or half an inch tall. Uh, it's also why we don't have people with IQs of 1,000 or 0 0.05 points. Human genetics maintains our species in an equilibrium that's adapted to our environment. So when an individual has an extreme characteristic, that characteristic usually is not amplified in the next generation, but tends to return to the mean value. And regression to the mean doesn't apply only to humans. It also applies to any system that maintains a stable equilibrium over time. And that includes the weather. So let's suppose you're going through a dry spell, a drought, which is a, an extreme of the weather. Well, droughts don't go on forever. So sooner or later, the drought will break and you'll get rain as the environment starts to regress to its mean or average level of rainfall. So the longer the drought goes on, the closer you're likely to be to the end of the drought, and the more likely it is that you'll get rain and the regression to the mean will start. Now, let's apply this situation to rainmakers. Um, they, get a, they get called into an area where there's been a lack of rainfall for some time. You know, people don't call them on the first day with no rain. The lack of rain needs to have gone on for a while, and then they call the rainmaker. But the rainmaker often can't drop everything and come right that minute. And with slow 19th and early 20th century travel, he likely wouldn't be able to get there with all his rainmaking gear immediately either. So he won't show up until we're later in the drought than when he was first contacted. And that means that he'll be arriving when we're closer to the natural end of the drought. So skeptics would claim his rainmaking really didn't do anything. It was just the environment resetting itself and regressing to the mean. You said that in addition to rainmaking when there wasn't any rain in the forecast, Pluviculturalists also had another way of trying to prove that what they were doing was real. What was that? Basically providing more rain than was expected. For example, if San Diego normally receives two inches of rain in January, then a rainmaker might offer you evidence for his abilities by saying, I'll give you six inches, tripling the normal amount, and then doing so. And so that would be a kind of statistical argument, not did it rain or not, but was there a statistically significant amount of extra rain when the rainmaking techniques were used compared to when they were not used? Can we arrive at any general conclusions about the rainmakers of the 19th century and Charles Hatfield? Did their rainmaking have any effect? It's really hard to say, and part of the reason is that measuring the efficacy of rainmaking is really hard. Um, that's true even today, as we're about to discuss, and it certainly was hard in the 19th and early 20th centuries because they didn't have the mountains of data that you really need to settle the question. They were operating in a largely anecdotal environment, and that makes it hard to make overall statistical judgments. In the case of Charles Hatfield, it does appear that he was sincere. Um, it was claimed that over the course of his career, he had something like 500 demonstrations and that he had a very high success rate. You could challenge that and say maybe the numbers have been exaggerated, though I don't know anyone who's produced more reliable ones spanning his career. And even if his success rate never exceeded random chance, that wouldn't stop him from being, being sincere. In The Rainmakers, Clark Spence writes, very likely he believed that his chemicals did help bring rain. As was true in the case of so many of the leading pluviculture exponents, it was this element of self-delusion, coupled with glib talk and splendid publicity, that made him a professional. And I think that could very well be true. Um, I don't know whether Hatfield's rainmaking efforts had any effect, and if they did have an effect, I suspect it would have been less than he claimed or believed, but one way or another, I think it's entirely possible that he was sincere in thinking he was having an effect. You think that we can establish today whether Hatfield was able to make rain or at least larger amounts of rain? I don't think so, uh, because nobody at the time was doing the kind of testing that you'd need to answer that question. 
it would depend on large scale statistical studies that nobody was doing. Um, skeptics can deny efficacy all they want. Um, for example, they might say Hatfield was a chemical pluviculturist, so how could his chemicals even get up high enough to influence clouds? But he was using heat to cause the chemical vapors to rise, and they don't have to get up that high to reach the clouds. Low altitude clouds, some of which can produce rain, are defined as those between the surface of the ground and 6,500 feet up. So his chemicals could have come into contact with some of these low level clouds and had an effect. Another way of trying to settle the matter would be to replicate his methods today, but he was protective of his formula and never disclosed it, so we don't know what it was and we can't test it. I'm sympathetic with the skeptics in this case, but I'm also sympathetic with the rainmakers. And while I think a lot of them likely had no ability to induce rain, I can't say that none of them did. And especially not Charles Hatfield, the most successful one of them all. The only way of settling the matter would be using statistical studies that were never done. Even if early, the early rainmakers had only a small amount of efficacy, I think we have to leave the question of their efficacy open because of what we know now about rainmaking. Okay, now that's a significant statement. What do we know now about rainmaking that means we should treat earlier rainmakers with an open mind? We know it can be done. The breakthrough came in 1946, after the end of Hatfield's rainmaking career, but 12 years before he passed on. You'll recall that Hatfield said he was in his, kitch in his kitchen when he noticed that steam from his tea kettle was attracted by certain chemicals. Well, in 1946, a 40-year-old American scientist named Vincent Schaefer was experimenting with a cloud in a box in his lab. But the temperature was too warm, so he put some dry ice, or frozen carbon dioxide, into the chamber, and he noticed the cloud started turning into snowflakes. Here, Vincent Schaefer explains the process. This is Vincent Schaefer speaking. I would like to take you into the laboratory and show you a few of the experiments that led us to our outdoor experiments in converting clouds into snow. Using a home freezing unit such as this, which has a temperature of around zero Fahrenheit, we can form supercool clouds just like those in the natural atmosphere by breathing into the box. The moist air from the breath condenses and forms a cloud, and this cloud cools to a temperature of about zero degrees Fahrenheit in a few seconds. Any moist thing placed in this box will produce such a cloud. By putting this cloud in the chamber, we can then do various things to it to see whether or not we can convert this supercooled cloud to snow. This cloud is made up of liquid water droplets. They are not snow crystals as yet, but by taking a tiny piece of dry ice such as this and scratching it so a few tiny fragments fall into the supercooled cloud, long streaks develop just like the vapor trail from an airplane. These contain millions and millions of tiny submicroscopic snow crystals which grow very fast and assume exactly the same forms that natural snowflakes uh, show in an ordinary snowstorm. The particles grow very fast. They grow about a billion fold in volume in a few seconds. And if it were possible to keep them supported in the air, they would grow very large, just like the snow crystals that fall from the sky on a cold winter's day. What Schaefer had discovered was a process now known as cloud seeding. In cloud seeding, you introduce small particles into the cloud, dry ice crystals in this case, which are the seeds, the particles you introduce. And then water from the cloud is attracted to the seeds and forms water droplets or snowflakes around it. When they get heavy enough, they fall out of the cloud and start heading towards the ground. Since Schaefer's time, various forms of cloud seeding have been developed, and they use principles that were part of 19th century rainmaking efforts. 
For example, you'll recall that James Powell Espy believed that you could use heat conduction or convection to produce rain. Well, a modern method of cloud seeding is known as the dynamic method. And in the dynamic method, you use the convection within the cloud to circulate the seeds and cause the rainfall to spread. Also, the chemical silver iodide is a commonly used one in the dynamic method, and forms of salt are also used to help make water droplets for rain. So the chemical method, rainmakers were right that getting certain chemicals into a cloud will promote rain. When it comes to how to get the seeds up to the clouds, there are three common methods today. One is using airplanes to drop the seeds into the cloud. And, of course, they didn't have airplanes in the 19th century, but they did use the equivalent, which was balloons. Another way is to use rockets to get the seeds up to the clouds and then explode, like the concussive rainmakers used rockets. A third uh, method used today is to use a ground-based plant that releases the particles slowly and uses heat to get them up to the cloud, just like the chemical rainmakers did. So Melbourne and Hatfield's idea of releasing chemicals from the ground and getting them up to the clouds wasn't wrong at all. In fact, they use this method today in Colorado to make snow for tourists who want to come to the state for skiing. What about proof-oriented research? Have there been modern studies that have shown cloud seeding to be effective? There have, and we'll have a link to a video by physicist Sabina Hassenfelder in which she explains how these studies work. But to give one example, they've done studies where they used radar to examine which part of a cloud the precipitation was coming from. And they found that this part of the cloud matched the trajectory of the airplane that flew through it to do the seeding. So you could tell the precipitation was caused by the seeding itself and wasn't just random chance. They've also tested chemicals that were believed to serve as effective seeds against chemicals that were not expected to be good seeds. And the correct chemicals were associated with precipitation in a way the other chemicals were not. They also double-checked by looking at the snow on the ground under their microscopes, and they discovered that it had indeed formed around the seeds. Finally, they've also done statistical studies to find out whether you can use cloud seeding to increase snow production long-term. They did this by measuring the snow that fell in the seeded areas compared to neighboring unseeded areas, and they found that current snow seeding efforts increased total snowfall by about 15 percent and there was a 95 percent confidence level in that finding meaning that the odds that it was due to random chance were just five percent so we have quite good evidence that current snow seeding technology improves total snowfall by a modest 15 percent what do you think that this tells us about the efforts of earlier rainmakers then I think it tells us we need to be cautious. Uh, both the true believers and the hardcore skeptics may have been sincere in their convictions, but they didn't have the studies that we do today, and both believers and skeptics likely made exaggerated claims in their own favor. Oh, this clearly works, or oh, this clearly can't work. Well, we know today that it can work, and modern methods use similar principles to the ones that were used back then. Those sim similarities of principles mean that the early rainmakers may have been doing some things right and were actually having an effect. On the other hand, the modern finding that current snow seeding technology only increases snowfall by 15% means that the effect was likely modest, so rainmakers probably weren't having as much of an effect as they thought they were. I'd Compare the situation to the difference between old-school alchemists and modern chemists. Uh, chemistry emerged from alchemy, and the alchemists had a knowledge of certain principles that let them do impressive things with chemicals. 
but they were still feeling their way and didn't have the modern precise knowledge that we have of chemistry. Similarly, early rainmakers were feeling their way, and they may have been using principles that really could sometimes produce rain or increase rain, but they didn't have our modern level of knowledge on the subject, so they wouldn't have been able to be as effective as modern cloud seeders or as effective as we may become with weather control in the future. Before we close, what should we say about Charles Hatfield's legacy? Today, he's still a subject of interest. Uh, his papers are housed at the San Diego Public Library. He was one of the men who inspired the modern practice of cloud seeding. And when the city of San Diego was looking at having cloud seeding done in 1948, they remembered Hatfield's flood and decided to take out insurance in case of another disastrous experience. Hatfield got posthumous recognition in 1973 when the native sons of the Golden West erected a historical monument to him in the Lake Mer at Lake Marina uh, with a bronze plaque. Unfortunately, the plaque was stolen in the 1980s, but in 1999, a new plaque was put up by the San Diego uh, by the County of San Diego and my favorite comedy heritage group, E. Clampus Vitus. The current plaque reads, Hatfield the Rainmaker. Charles M. Hatfield agreed with San Diego City Council members after a four-year drought to make it rain sufficiently to fill Lake Morena Reservoir for $10,000. His rain-enhancing tower and pans were erected south of this monument. Hatfield and Brother Paul worked diligently burning chemicals into the sky. Suddenly it began to rain, dumping 35 inches in one month on San Diego County. Two rainstorms in January 1916 caused great devastation, destroying Sweetwater Dam spillway, bursting Otai Dam, wiping out Otai Valley and Mission Valley, isolating San Diego and killing 14 people. Hatfield hurriedly left town and was never paid by the city for his services. Charles and Paul went on to enhance moisture around the world. Black, placed in cooperation with the County of San Diego and the Ancient and Honorable Order of E. Clampus Vitus, Squeebob Chapter, April 24th, 1999. And so Charles Hatfield continues to be remembered in San Diego today. So Jimmy, what's your bottom line on Charles Hatfield and the Rainmakers? Charles Hatfield is a fascinating historical figure. He was by far the most successful of the Rainmakers, and he was apparently sincere. He racked up an impressive list of demonstrations, and despite the limited knowledge of his time, his rainmaking efforts may have actually had some effect. He also was one of the men who paved the way for modern cloud seeding techniques. Whether he was ultimately responsible for Hatfield's flood is a matter of conjecture and rather doubtful, but the principles of his ground-based chemical seeding method is still being used today to produce snow for ski enthusiasts. And Jimmy, what further resources can we offer to the listeners and viewers? We'll have links to Clark Spence's book, The Rainmakers, American Pluviculture to World War II. Also, Robert Graves' books, I, Claudius, and Claudius the God and His Wife, Messalina. The 1956 film, The Rainmaker, where you can watch that. Also, the 1974 film, Chinatown, that involved the California Water Wars. We'll have links to pages on Charles Hatfield. Also, a link to a master's thesis by Milford Donaldson about Hatfield, information on rainmaking, Sabina Hassenfelder on rainmaking, as well as information about Vincent Schaefer, including his snowmaking demonstration video, info on rainfall in San Diego, rainfall in Boston, rainfall in Fayetteville, Arkansas, the California Water Wars, True West's article, Bombs Over Texas, about the concussion method, JSTOR Daily's article on Hatfield, and information about the Dust Bowl and E. Clampus Vitus. Excellent. So that's it from us. What are your theories about Charles Hatfield and the Rainmakers? You can let us know by visiting sqpn.com or the Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World Facebook page, sending an email to mysterious at sqpn.com, sending a tweet to at mys underscore world, visiting the StarQuest Discord community at sqpn.com slash discord, 
or by calling our mysterious feedback line at 619-738-4515. That's 619-738-4515. And I want to say a special thanks to Oasis Studio 7 for the video and animation work they did on this episode. Uh, you can check out their work at my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Jimmy Aiken. And while you're there, I'd appreciate it if you subscribe and hit the bell notification because I am trying to grow my channel on YouTube and I'd really appreciate it. Jimmy, what were you going to talk about next time? Well, I mentioned earlier in this episode that the reason we don't have humans that are 75 feet tall is because of regression to the mean. Uh, so next episode, we're going to be talking about a subject we've had a lot of requests for, giants, uh, including giants in the Bible like Goliath, but also giants in history and folklore. We'll be looking at the scientific bases for giant stories, what causes giantism, and how big humans can actually get. Excellent. Folks, be sure to follow Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World in Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn your favorite podcast app or at Jimmy's YouTube channel where you should hit that bell to get notifications. You can find links to Jimmy's resources from our discussion on our show notes at mysterious.fm slash 242. And remember to help us continue to produce the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World is also brought to you by Fairvento Law PLLC, now assisting clients with expungements and set-asides of Michigan convictions. To learn more, call 231-202-3321 or go to fearventolaw.com. F-I-O-R-V-E-N-T-O law.com. And by DeliverContacts.com, offering contact lenses at low prices with free delivery. Visit DeliverContacts.com. Until next time, Jimmy Aiken, thank you for exploring with us our mysterious world. Thanks, Dom. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World on StarQuest. <laughs>